how it really happened. When the era of patriarchy came, priest and militant leaders usurped power. That's how many gods endowed with human passions appeared as well as bloodthirsty ten gods who were portrayed in material bodies with symbols of power and attributes of immortality. And this entire system of power was promoted owing to a mixture of particles of spiritual grains of primordial knowledge. Otherwise, it would not be so attractive to a majority of people with directives beneficial to the system, such as division of people, domination of some over others, hatred, intolerance. As a result, society has degraded by means of the conventional patterns of consciousness, programs, military clashes, conquest, exploitations. A simple example is the first Sumerian city-states in which the first kings ruled. Have you ever wondered why world history in different countries of the world and school textbooks and textbooks for higher educational institutions begins with the 4th through 3rd millennium BC from the ancient cities of Mesopotamia and Egypt and then as a rule ancient India, China and Alada, ancient Greece are pointed out. Why is the attention of new generations intentionally concentrated on this Middle Eastern region? and precisely on this particular period of time. Based on whose initiative, or more precisely, who is the sponsor of the dominance of exactly this opinion and this inexact science of guessing dates and events? As though nothing more significant had existed before, neither megalithic cities on different continents nor trapillion cities of 10,000 people in the territory of ancient Europe, nor highly developed cities in Eurasia, whose inhabitants led a peaceful way of life. It's not even reported that before the Sumerians there had lived people in Mesopotamia who had particularly revered the Alatra sign, as well as other people on different continents since ancient times. And why in this world history of the selected ones were all communities of people before this period conditionally called cultures and later on civilizations and the first city-states? The answer lies in this word, state. Due to adoptions from other languages and translations, we come across such interpretations as dominance, lordship, dominus, lord, might, head of the family. Ancient sources of the origin of the word dominance led to the Sumerians. After all, it was at this time in the East that active propaganda of the ancient supreme deity, the primal forefather named El, began. The history of his rise, the struggle for power with old gods and their overthrowing, the rule of the nations by his children, and the assembly of gods under his rule. Considering that the power of religion reigned supreme in Sumeria, and it propagandized the assembly of gods led by the main god, it becomes clear from what family of gods the example of governance of peoples was copied. The Kingdom of the Mind What did the history of the so-called civilization of the people that had come to the fertile valley of Mesopotamia start from? From carve-up of surplus and from bureaucracy? The first pictographic texts were accounting records. 
economic list and checklist. To put it simply, the era of matriarchy was ruined by daily routine as well as by patriarchy's thirst for power. The same thing happens to a person who loses spiritual connection with God within himself. Dictatorship of consciousness arises in him. He begins to pay excessive attention to his living conditions in three-dimensionality at a loss to his spiritual development. And when the kingdom of the mind predominates, everything is stereotyped. Regardless of whether in a family or in a community, identification of an external enemy, a desire to seize neighboring territories, exploitation of surrounding people, and the struggle for power. What does this lead to? Was the country of Sumer actually a country of free people? Sumer of the late 3rd millennium BC was a country that constantly waged aggressive wars. A country of mercenaries, of slaves bought or captured in the war. A country of debtor slaves who sold their family members and themselves into slavery. It was a country that lived by a collection of laws of kings who proclaimed themselves vicars of gods. The country of 30 pieces of silver where human life was expressed in the measure of the value of commodity of that time, silver. This is evidenced by the tablets with annual reports of overseers concerning transactions with labor force and slaves. And this kingdom of mind of the slaves and servants of God Alil spread its tentacles to Syria, Asia Minor, and Alam. Strangers with the Story of El The ethnonym, meaning the name Sumerians, is a scientific abstraction. It's not a self-designation of the people. This name is simply used to denote the people who came to Mesopotamia fertile lands. The general literary heritage of ancient Mesopotamia, which has been preserved through the cuneiform tablets of the Sumerians and then the Akkadians who adopted their heritage, and later on in the writings of the Babylonian priest, tells first and foremost the story of a power formation, which repeats the antediluvian history of the omnipotence of long-lived El and his elite. El here is already endowed with the qualities of God, Enlil, Akkadian Elil, who later on became one of the main gods of the Sumerian Akkadian pantheon. Moreover, echoes of the old legends left from the primordial knowledge can be traced here, about the seven gods among whom was also Enlil, one of Araman's names, about the fact that Enlil was the second to the heavenly god named Anu and was his permanent representative on earth. But already in the Sumerian legends, the antediluvian story of the world autocrat El is actively ascribed to Enlil of the seven gods. The following become Enlil's main epithets, the great mountain, the lord of all the lands, the lord who determines destinies, the lord whose utterances are immutable, and the father of gods. There was even such an expression, the Enlil of all the gods, Enlilship over the gods. The term Enlilship means dominance, lordship. In the Sumerian hymn, Enlil is everywhere, in which Enlil is honored, his epithets and deeds of gods are listed. This cult text designed to intensify collective emotions contains such words. Without Enlil, the great mountain, no cities would be built, no settlements founded, no stalls would be built, no sheepfolds established, no king would be raised, no high priest born, no ma priest, no high priestess would be chosen as oracle. Soldiers would have no generals or captains. The temple of Enlil is a mountain of abundance. They take offerings there. The grant absolution. Enlil, the shepherd upon whom you gaze favorably, the legitimate one, whom you have raised over the land, the foreign land at his hand, the foreign land at his foot, as well as the most distant of foreign lands you make subservient to him. There's a good example. One of the first ancient cities of Mesopotamia, Eridu, is called the city of the first kings. According to legends, its patron, god Inki, the son of Enlil, acts as the organizer of the world order on earth. 
The city is ruled by the son of Inki himself, a man named Adapa, who was half god, half human hero. It was believed that Adapa was the one who brought civilization to the city from the island of Domun, meaning from the island of the immortals. By the way, in the Akkadian mythology, Adapa is one of the seven sages. A similar story about the seven sages much later existed also in ancient Greece, Alada, where Solon was also called one of the seven sages. Nothing more than folklore, myths, epic, fiction? What patterns of behavior were implanted in the minds of the younger generation? And who benefited from this? The Sumerians began to actively write and replicate text of the legends about the country of El. For these purposes, special schools were opened, idaba, or tablet houses, scribal schools, where they began to prepare scribes and those who would be their heralds among the people. It is interesting that when the Sumerian language had become dead, up to the first millennium BC, it was used as a sacred literary language and a language of science in that very Assyria and Babylon. In fact, Latin today is used according to the same scheme. That is, the dead Sumerian language was understandable only to the selected ones. Moreover, Many symbols of cuneiform writing express precisely Sumerian words and their meaning, whereas phonation of Akkadian words was initially written through combinations of Sumerograms, similar to present-day rebuses and charades. Yet, why were such complexities and secret actions needed for transmission of ordinary literary epos, myths and folklore, if it was such? The Sumerians made the text convenient for memorization and easily perceivable by ear. Moreover, the plot was designed so as to cause collective emotions by means of the story, to put a crowd of listeners into an emotional state set in the text. Because the content was mostly known to listeners in advance, generally speaking, in modern understanding, to prepare mass media journalists, although for a long time, before this, cult texts had been just memorized and passed on from generation to generation. By the way, exactly the same method was used several centuries later for dissemination of Homer's Iliad among the Hellenes and other peoples. Only those heralds, journalists, were already called rhapsodes, the sons of Homer. Why did such a bureaucratic state as Sumer, where everything was on a register, even every fruit on a tree was counted, suddenly allow itself such spendings on epos. What were the goals of the sponsors of this activity? The fact is that all this mythology intertwined with religion consequently affected the worldview of not only these people, but also of the successors to their literary heritage, the Akkadians and later the Babylonians and from them it was spread to other peoples, but with the only difference that in subsequent generations they no longer remembered the primordial, but literally took on trust what was said by local priests who were concerned about their power. The system has strengthened its positions in the minds of people. Basically, a role model for imitation was being prepared for people. What human-like gods allowed themselves to do was the same thing people did following their example. Moreover, the goal of human existence was being substituted. Instead of the true meaning of human life, understanding of what a human had been created for, that is, transformation into a spiritual being merging with God's love within oneself. Priests, under the dictation of their consciousness, were implanting things beneficial for the system into the minds of the congregation Namely, since childhood, a person was being implanted with an idea that the goal of creation of a human being was to work for gods, to cultivate land, to graze cattle, to collect fruits, to feed gods with their sacrifices. That is, to work for El and his elite, devoting all their lives and all their attention to the external, which is what is still observed to this day 
in such a format of human society as a consumer civilization. Worldview Sumerian and Babylonian literature What was hidden in the model for imitation? Pridefulness Murder Drunkenness Deceit Revenge Vanity Selfishness Betrayal Human love with the help of witchcraft Generally speaking, all those same pattern directives of the system in the people's consciousness Division of people, as in El's country, the systems, ideology, divide and rule. As in El's country, and this will be explained in detail later in the story about the gods of Olympus, in the legends of the priest of ancient Mesopotamia, people were divided into gods, heroes and savages, and considering how the descendants of the Atlanteans, the Archons have replicated these images in the minds of people for centuries striving for a single world power. This can be observed even now in the modern world society. The assembly of gods, elite, were patrons of people, endowed with all human attributes and qualities, possessing magic objects, high technologies. As an example, God Shamash made it easier for the hero Gilgamesh to defeat the monster, thanks to the seven winds that blow at the will of Shamash. The monster had killing rays and guarded a special area of unusual cedar forest of the god Alil. Today, many rich people of the world dream of being elected to the circles of the world elite, or at least of being of use to them strive to have protection and their patronage for their mini empire, be it a business or an influence on a territorial region. Heroes, an example, the image of Gilgamesh, were lucky fellows, all of whose feats were not due to their own merit, but due to some mighty patron among the gods, from the elite of El, who possessed magic objects, that is, there was a programmed hero who was supposed to destroy the evil that his patron considered to be evil and then to die young. In general, as the gods would decide at the council of the gods, during their short life, the heroes had to think about the meaning of life, to seek immortality in the body since the gods had already possessed this immortality and the highest manifestation of courage it should have been a recognition of one's own defeat, promoted later in literature to the point of the hero's suicide. Today, millions of people since childhood dream to be like the famous hero Superman of their time, from worldwide popular movies, TV series promoted by mass media, and as adults, by imitating them, many people risk their lives for the sake of realization of the world elite's plans while they don't even know who they actually work for and why. Savages Example, the image of Enkidu, the servant of Gilgamesh. A savage, a faceless creature who joined the civilization and became devoted servant of the hero. He had to pay to the gods with his sufferings and death for his and the hero's common accomplishments. Today, billions of people stay in a state of misery and poverty, barely living from paycheck to paycheck. Since childhood, they dream of at least standing next to famous people, not to mention of being as useful for them as possible in order to break out of poverty to become decent people. Fixed Idea – Immortality in the Body the system's dream about its immortality. The striving of the main hero to achieve immortality takes a central stage in the Mesopotamian literature. The epic titled, He Who Saw Everything, about the hero Gilgamesh, is built around this plot and is repeated in different versions for different peoples, on which the sphere of influence of the descendants of El 
spread in different centuries. But it's important to note the main theme of these works. It is supposedly impossible for a person to achieve the main goal of his search, eternal life. The futility of human efforts in trying to attain immortality and eternal youth, that is, the fate of the gods, and the ending, that is, the emphasis on the idea of the work, highlights that only immortality that is available to a person is the memory of his deeds that glorified his image and name. What do we see today? Billions of people don't know about the spiritual aim of their lives. Other billions of people considering themselves religious people don't know how to really achieve immortality in life. This lack of knowledge is used by the world elite for their own secret manipulative goals. And how many people in the world dream about their own career? To become famous, glorify their name, commemorate it for the ages so that everyone would know about them. For such a mass psychosis, all the conditions have been created in the consumer society by the hands of people themselves. And it doesn't matter in what scale one or another consciousness thinks. One dreams to glorify one's name through some nonsense on the internet, having put up a lot of photos of oneself. And another, via a supermind, releasing volumes of scientific works with his photograph. Or giving his name to a new kind of mollusk. Everyone's consciousness works stereotypically to glorify one's own name. But why? Is the system interested in promoting such a pattern as immortality in the body, achievement of eternal youth? And why does it focus a person's attention on promotion of his own image and name? Knowing the primordial spiritual knowledge and realizing that the system changes the essence of the knowledge, one can understand that the answer is hidden in two points. Immortality in the body. Today, they call it salvation and glorifying the name. According to the primordial spiritual knowledge, any person can achieve immortality during the temporary existence of his body. That is, spiritually develop himself by means of the deepest feelings to such a state of inner spiritual transformation when he, the personality as a spirit begins to live in the spiritual world. It's important to know that only spirit can be immortal, but not the physical body or consciousness. Consciousness doesn't understand this. God is a material image for it. Consciousness is incapable of experiencing deep feelings. It can only talk, think, and create emotions. And what does consciousness understand? It understands only what the system understands. In the system's understanding, immortality in the body is prolongation of life beyond the species limit. It's an increase in the term of one's own life. Although the system understands its own finiteness, after all, its lifetime is predetermined as that of an ordinary program. So, the promise of immortality in physical body is its pattern trick proven by millennia. An illusion by living which people, without being aware of it, waste the real power of their attention on feeding the system. And glorification of one's own name via an image in the centuries is also beneficial for the system. Thus it churns subpersonalities for itself, which are also food for the system, being dead among the living.